Hey, listeners, I want to thank our good friends at Slipped Disc for their enthusiastic support of Speaking Soundly. Be sure to check out slipdisc.com for the latest inside information on classical music now. Oh, and while you're here, could you do me a favor? If you like this show, follow it. It's pretty simple, really, and it's free. Just click the follow button on whatever podcast app you're listening to right now. And if you already follow the show, click the share podcast button and send Speaking Soundly to your friends and relatives that also like listening to candid and inspiring conversations with some of the best musicians on the planet. All right. So thanks again for the continued support. We really appreciate it. Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter and pianist Regina Spector journeyed from Moscow to the Bronx and from classical music to indie pop stardom. While her early training as a pianist and passion for classical music shaped her iconic sound, it did provide for some challenging moments along the way. It was just very confusing to me. And it was very, very, very sad because to me it was just like, I didn't even know there were other ways of being a musician. I'm either going to become a classical musician or... I will just not have music in my life. You're listening to Speaking Soundly, a backstage pass to today's biggest stars of the music world. I'm your host, David Krause, principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera. During each episode, you'll hear me speak with inspiring performers about their creative process and the personal journey that led them to the stage. It's so great to talk to you. I love your music and you have no idea how much you're upping my street cred as a classical musician when I get back to my orchestra rehearsal next week. So thank you. That's really the nicest thing for my inner cred. For, for me, anytime I get to interact with anything to do with the classical world, my inner self lights up because I always feel like I snuck in through some weird door that I didn't know existed into music. And I think one of my favorite sounds, you know, of like, art sounds, let's say, not like children laughing and roaring ocean and stuff like that, but of human made sounds is, is um, that moment before an opera or a concert starts. And especially at the Met when the porcupine lights start to go up and they get dimmy and then the orchestra tunes in this way. And I just always just kind of squint my eyes, it becomes very foggy and I just let it wash over me. It's one of my favorite sounds ever. I think if somebody would ever just give me like an hour of that as a concert, I would just be very, very happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I could arrange that. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm actually speaking to you now from the studio that I teach at, at Manhattan School of Music, where you spent your Saturdays as a high school student, right? No. Wait, time out. I thought you went to, well, but I've read that in so many articles about you. No, oh, I've man. never gotten, no. See, what happened was. This interview so my, is not going well. It's going just <laughs> great. No, because I know where this idea originated. When I came to the Bronx and I was nine and a half, I'd already studied piano since I was six with my wonderful teacher in Moscow. And one of the great things about the Soviet Union, and there weren't that many, but one of the great ones was that anybody could have a music education for free and you could go for, for 12 years if you want. And so I, I had this music education. My mom and my dad, well, they gave me this beginning of a music education. And then they got to America. And in America, you have to have money to have music lessons. And so it was kind of understood that I was never going to study again. And I really struggled with that because it was my favorite thing in the world. And through this incredible generosity that my, my dad met this violinist on the subway, actually coming home, back home, who was sitting on the, on the one train heading back to the Bronx from Manhattan and who had a violin case next to him. And he sat next to him and started the conversation. And they got to talking and my dad expressed to him, you know, how in Russia we used to all the time go and see classical concerts. So he said, oh, my wife and I are about to embark on, on a, you know, a tour of Spain. We're playing duets. She plays piano and I play violin. Why don't you just come up to our house on Sunday 
and we'll just play our program for you. And why don't you just come for lunch? So uh, we were so excited. We all kind of put on whatever nice things we had and we walked up the hill to their house and they performed this program for us and they gave us this beautiful lunch and they were so nice. And then at the end of it all, I just came up to Sonia, Sonia Vargas was the pianist. And I just said, will you be my teacher? And she said, of course. And then I said, will you be Marcia's teacher, who is my cousin and she, who also studied piano? And she said, yes, of course. And from then on, she was just our teacher for free. Um, not only that, but we didn't have an instrument, right? So we didn't have a piano. So we would go to her house multiple times a week to practice. Every time we went, they would feed us and give us snacks and we could play with the animal. I mean, it just became this incredible, like home away from home. So this is a long, long way of telling you where the Manhattan School of Music thing came from. Sonia was a professor at Manhattan School of Music. And so because of that, I was always saying, you know, my teacher was, you know, from Manhattan School of Music because it was just, to me, just having a teacher like that, I don't know, it's, I still all the time just can't believe that this happened. During this time, you were just nine years old. You didn't speak any English. You had to completely start over as your parents navigated this new life in the United States. Amid all the practical uncertainties that you and your family were dealing with as new immigrants, where did art and music fit into your lives? Well, I think it really kept us sane. You know, the first thing that we got when we got into our little roach infested first apartment, <laughs> I mean, this was, it was really rough. There was lots of bars on all windows. Everything was locked. You felt like you, you were just in a roach jail. And the first purchase that was made by my parents was a boombox. This black Sony boombox, it, it had two cassettes so we could record, copy tapes. And then very soon after, their friends who had been in America maybe for a year longer than us brought us these cassette tapes and they were Mozart piano concertos. It was like food, you know, you just, and I would just listen to the radio and I would find the different stations and I would just kind of explore. I mean, we learned English watching television, you know, these things, music, radio, television. I think for immigrants, for refugees, it's this lifeline because you're very isolated in this completely new place. I had everything else. I had my parents, I was going to school. There was a really nice Jewish community and every once in a while, someone would just donate a bag of clothes and I could find something that fit. I didn't really need anything, but the art was like, that was the piece where I could be absolutely transported listening to a free radio station, just having the best time in the world. And you're doing this without the piano that you grew up with in Russia. Obviously, your family couldn't bring it to the States with you. You were really young, but do you have memories of that piano? Do you remember it? Yeah. I. So it was a little light brown Petro piano, which is a Czech piano. They used to have these fantasies that I would somehow bump into my piano somewhere out there in the world. And I, I could recognize it. Because one day my mom was away and my dad and I were cleaning in our little apartment in Moscow. And my dad was dusting a little vase that was on top of the piano and it slipped and he caught it into the piano and it dented it. But the vase didn't break, but there was this little chip that was just right in the middle of the piano, just missing. And I always thought, oh, you know, I could. If I ever bumped into it, I would know exactly that it was the one my grandfather got my mom. But yeah, like saying goodbye to, to that 
particular piano and then just not having a piano was really, really hard for me. It's a very specific sadness, right? Because I had to also say goodbye to my grandparents. I didn't think I would ever see them again. I had to say bye to my piano teacher. That was excruciating. But then it's like this specific thing where it's not a person, but it's kind of like person, you know, it's your friend. And the sort of realization after a while that, oh, like it might be years till I actually have a piano. And I, I read that in the interim, you would imagine a keyboard in your head and just play on the windowsill. Is that true? Well, the story is more glorious than my capabilities. I would just approximate and I would just play. And I, I did it more, the feeling of it. I did it on the windowsill the most because then you could look out the window. And that's nice. But I also just would do it on any hard surface. Like I loved doing it on the table. I loved it. I had this weird fear that my fingers would get stiff and I would just would lose everything and I wouldn't know how to play. It was like keeping myself weirdly prepared for when and if I ever got a piano again, you know. And so I just didn't want to become like this fossil at the age of 10 who lost everything. I would just tell myself I'm practicing. And I think it really made a difference because weirdly, if you have the feelings of music and then you're sort of doing the motion of it, you know, maybe it's kind of like, you know how they say that if you smile when you're sad, it somehow works its way backwards into you. Like they have done these studies that show that even if somebody doesn't feel like smiling, if they actually kind of put themselves into a smile, that it actually works on their inner world and they get dopamine or whatever. I think maybe it was like that where I would have the feelings of music and I would play on this table and at the end, I would sort of have the kind of satisfaction of, I practiced, <laughs> you know, I just would walk away and would, yeah, I did it. I'll practice some more tomorrow, you know? <laughs> so at this point in your life, classical music is everything to you. And the goal is to become a concert pianist. But talk to me about when you realized that maybe it wasn't in the cards. I read that at one point you were concerned about the size of your hands. Like you have small hands, I guess, and that might limit the dexterity and what you can do on the piano. Was that one of the factors that led you away from this classical life? You know, what's really interesting. I never, ever thought that me not becoming a classical pianist had anything to do with the size of my hands, even though I was very aware that I would always have to modify pieces, right? It was, it was the other skills and I would say talents that it takes to become a classical musician that I was lacking that really like started. What? Um, I think that the ability to practice a certain amount of time is a kind of talent. It's almost like, I think to become a classical musician, I kind of liken it to the Olympics because besides having the emotional connection and the love and even the musicality, it's a kind of drive and athleticism that is beyond those things. And you need to kind of have it. And it's almost like if you want to reach outer space, you need to have those powerful, th that fire, those initial engines that like push you out, it out of the atmosphere and you go, go, go. And then certain things drop off and then you're floating, right? And that's the classical musicians. They're out there in cosmos and they're floating and there's no amount of like will or letting go or meditating. You have to have this powerful thing. You figured that out when you were 16 or 17 years old? I did, but it was forced upon me. And it came through like this very deep sadness of I should be able to sit there and practice this piece that I love with all my heart 
and work on it. And I have this amazing teacher and I could hear how it should be and I could feel how it should be. And yet here I am scribbling poetry or here I am reading 50 books instead of doing that, dealing with this brain of mine that was like, well, why is it that I am staring out of a window for three hours straight when I should be practicing? It was just very confusing to me. And it was very, very, very sad because uh, to me, it was just like, I didn't even know there were other ways of being a musician. I just was like, I'm either going to become a classical musician or I will just not have music in my life, you know? And it was a very, very rough time. And then the idea of writing songs occurred through friends, literally, you know. How did, how did, how did it occur? Oh, so <laughs> when I was 16, I went on this teen trip on a full scholarship, thankfully, to Israel. And it was a teen's art trip. And the thing that would unite us was that we were all kind of interested in the arts or creative in some way. And I just found it so inspiring because it came at this moment of profound lostness where I was just like, who can I turn to to like help me be happy again? You know, because I'm not happy in my practicing and everywhere I look, I'm failing, you know? So you're in an emotional desert and you go to an actual desert. An actual desert. <laughs> an actual, yes, at the height of summer, doing hikes in the Negev desert in Israel. I was struggling. And what happened was, I didn't realize it, but I would sing to myself as I would hike. I think it was just a, a, a survival mechanism. And I would sing up these little, I don't know, acapella songs, and I would get into the rhythm of walking. And I... I would just finish a hike and I would just sort of be this sweaty mess. And then a few kids would come up to me and they'd be like, those are really cool songs. Like, what was that? You know, and I'd be like, I don't know. I didn't even realize I was singing. They were like, well, try and remember it next time. And then you could sing it to us when we sit down. So I would try and actually start it consciously trying to make something up. And then at the end of it all, they were like, well, you know, when you go back home, you should try to learn an instrument or something because then you could just write songs. And I was like, You're like I got you covered. I know an instrument, you know? <laughs> it was just like, I, but, but, you know, the process of going from playing these amazing pieces by like the greatest composers uh, through history and then playing this like, um, ta, um, ta, you know, I couldn't even keep, the, the coordination of singing while playing the left hand and the right hand, that, that was so difficult. You're kidding me. I watch you perform and it seems like second nature. Like your hands are doing one thing and you're singing another. That was learned? That was not intuition? It was so difficult, but it's so amazing that you say that because that fire that it takes to become the classical musician. When I tell you that every waking moment, every ounce of effort for hours of concentration, I could go and I could be trying to do something with my left and something with my right and singing. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do? All of a sudden that was it. I don't even think it was conscious, but all of that was thrown towards songs. And I just, it was like this, happy effort. You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing. It's like the happy effort feels like not effort at all. Eight hours could go by and I just, and I would, I wouldn't feel it. And all of a you, sudden- You escaped the orbit like you were talking about. You were in space. Yeah. It just in this, through this other way, it took me a very long time not to, you know, feel like it was some big cop out and to accept that it's just another way of being in the world. I love music so much. I move and breathe it, but I only have this one particular pathway into it. Yeah. You know, I really love your voice. And in speaking with you now, I think I just pinpointed why. It, even your speaking voice is really 
musical. And that's not always the case with singers. Like, for example, I work at the opera house and there's a cafeteria there. And once I was there in the cafeteria line behind Renee Fleming, yeah. and, she, and she was ordering a grilled cheese sandwich or something like that. And it just amazed me to hear her sound like a normal person <laughs> ordering her a grilled cheese sandwich. And then she'd go on the stage and their just heavenly voice would flow out. But your voice, even as I'm speaking with you now, is littered with these curvy vowel sounds and crisp <laughs> consonants that make your voice so expressive without singing. I don't even know if there's a question here other than, are you aware of the individuality and the uniqueness of your own voice? Oh my God. Well, can I tell you my Renee Fleming story? Absolutely. Because, okay. So, well, first of all, that is very nice and very kind and makes me feel good about my voice. A lot of the time, when I hear my voice, I just sort of, I just feel like, wait, do I sound like I'm seven? You know what I think? Maybe I do. Um, <laughs> I just, I just feel immature, you know, when I hear it. But I, I truly appreciate that. Um, so a bunch of years ago, the violinist Joshua Bell, he was doing a collaboration with different musicians spanning different genres. And I was in the room and it was a pretty small room, but it had a grand piano in it. And I was just practicing, you know, because I was quite nervous. And then Renee Fleming walks in and she said, oh, do you mind if I just warm up? And I was like, oh, of course. And I just got <laughs> out of the way. But within seconds, she played these notes. And then she just sang, I don't remember if it was a scales or arpeggios or what, but it was like the amount of voice that came out in this room, it was so profound. Like the proportion of air to voice, it was so hard not to just burst out crying. You just get surrounded by it and you're in it and it's so moving. Yeah. You've said that you're not a confessional songwriter and that your lyrics read more like a piece of fiction than a diary, but the music that you set your words to sound to me like they're a direct reflection of your life. For example, when I hear you weave a Bach fugue into your song, Two Birds, like towards the end, mm. I can picture you at the piano practicing that fugue. So even when you're writing a song that's not about you, do you find that it always ends up being about you anyway? Yes. The reason why that statement exists is because I realized that when somebody writes a play, people understand that all the characters are not them. They understood that I, in a book, is not I. But in music, they didn't because people kept asking me all these things about all these made up songs and all these stories. And I would just be like, oh, wouldn't this be interesting? Or, wow, that's a cool idea. I wonder what, if I pull on this thread or pull on that. There are musicians where their I is really them. Like someone like Joni Mitchell, it really is her. It's, she wants you to know that it's her. But I'm with Hans Christian Andersen over there. I, I love fairy tales. I just would venture to say that I think fiction is not any less filled with true emotion and true reflection of the person making it just because all of the things are made up. So speaking of fiction, one of my favorite songs of yours is a honky-tonk country song called Love is a Whore. And I, and I think I love it so much because it's the only country song I know written by a Russian Jew from Riverdale. Is there... <laughs> Is there any music that you don't feel comfortable approaching and making your own? It's so funny to me that you know that song, especially you, because I really love that song. It makes me happy. Um, I think that there isn't anything that I wouldn't do if I felt moved to do it. We live in a world where you are either a person who makes 10 records full of songs like that, or you don't do it at all. Mm. And so in that way, sometimes I kind of find it hard to understand what my place is. But I just, 
I just keep trying to have that faith in the fact that if I feel moved to do something, I'm allowed to do it. Last year, you gave a solo performance at Carnegie Hall just a few months after losing your father. What did it feel like to be on the stage of this historic hall playing after attending so many concerts there with your dad and your mom? Did those memories and emotions make your job of performing any more difficult or did it empower it? Uh, That Carnegie Hall show was very... So my dad, well, my dad was very sick. The show was supposed to happen originally in April. And for many weeks leading up to it, it was sort of this beacon of like, he was going to go to this show. Like we would have these conversations, logistical conversations, like how he was going to show up or like where there would be access to like not having to walk up any steps. And it was like this race to this show. We had to cancel that show because the show would have been on his last day of his shiva. So he never made it to the show. And then when I did play the show, it was very surreal because the kind of love and the kind of energy and the kind of feeling that was there, it was really not explainable. But the other thing that sort of happened with that show was that I had this profound bout of vertigo and the vertigo had come on from this altitude sickness that I got while playing in Colorado. Uh, Actually, what it was was disembarkment syndrome, which is something that astronauts get when we were talking about getting into outer space. We started, I guess it's a, it's a perfect arc. Everything was swaying. So Carnegie Hall was swaying. It was like I was on a huge cruise ship. But I just did my my best to sort of just be very, very present and not let anybody down. In a way, I'm almost grateful for the struggle because with Carnegie Hall, I think that had I not been so physically struggling, it would actually have been much harder Mm. because it almost numbed me. Like I could concentrate on the physical struggle of playing it and I could not fully suffer the depths of not having him there. You know, honestly, it's difficult to talk about it, but in another way, I'm glad to talk about it because I love my dad so much that any time I get to talk about him is is a kind of celebration to me. So in that way, it's, it's, I guess it's good practice. <laughs> well, I want to ask you, when you perform and your audiences are hanging on every single note that you play and getting so much from you, your songs and your voice and your piano playing, in those moments of making that connection with thousands, tens of thousands of people, what does it feel like for you? What are you getting out of this magical transaction through performance? Yeah, it feels like this unbelievable privilege. It's like the greatest gift somebody can give you is to let you be useful. I know I'm useful to the people that love me in my life. You know, I know that I'm useful to my kids. I know I'm useful to my family. I feel useful in a, in a life way a lot. And I love it. But to be useful in an art way, I mean, That's kind of the dream. And I think that that's what they give me. I walk away from that and I just feel like we connected. We did this. Like I I was just in Guadalajara and there's always a part of me that's like, is anyone going to show up? You know, like, (laughs) are they just going to like go and get their car and leave? You know, like you just never know. And they sang every word and I was so inspired. It just made me want to make art. It just made me want to write more songs we're here singing together (laughs) they know these songs you know it just makes me happy it's the best way of putting it i hope you enjoyed this episode of speaking soundly if you like what you heard please tell your friends about it spread the word 
Be sure to follow, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up on future episodes, follow us on Instagram at SpeakingSNDLY and visit our website, ArtfulNarrativesMedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist speaking soundly.